52 cultures. Yeah. So we, we have 52 cultures. Actually, there are more than 52. There are what the constitution acknowledges there are 65. But there could even be more than 65 because we consider that within the mainstream cultures that we know it, there are subcultures. So maybe just officially that we have 65 ethnic groups but more than 65 cultures. But it also depends on how we want to look at culture. Is culture only a thing of ethnic groups? So we also look at culture in religious perspective or mm. other perspectives in... Um, Organizations? Because, yes, it's mainly a way of organizing a particular group, of organi organizing uh, lifestyles. Uh, norms or what that group chooses to guide their living. So that can be within an organization, it can be within an ethnic group, in a religion. Jimmy, uh, would you give me an example so that um, we, we can easily catch up with where you are? Uh, like, uh, let's say I belong to the Catholic uh, group uh, in terms of religion that Catholics have a way of doing things, that when you're for service, you know this has to be done like this, or a Catholic, before you eat, you have to do this and this, that there are symbols, there are norms, there are uh, sometimes even some sort of folk ways, and a, a sort of communication that is used. Okay. Yeah, which you can find even in ethnic uh, groups. Yeah. Actually, yeah. with cultures, eh, I think it depends on a particular tribe. All tribes have their different cultures. I will tell you, there are cultures that Basoga find okay, there are cultures that Baganda find okay, but there are those ones that they share. So it really depends. When we talk about 60 something cultures, Jimmy, did you say 65? 65. 65, tribes. Uh, 65, those 65 are ethnic tribes. Groups. Mm. Those are ethnic groups, actually. Mm. But when we go to other tribes, it could be about an ethnic group, it could be about a culture, it could be about a religion. So the cultures are really, really many. Do you think culture has a place today? Yes, it has. It has a it, it has a plus. Do you it think has. it's important that we, we yes, maintain the culture is. that we've grown up with or that we've mm. our parents had? I think culture is important today. I would say positive culture is important today mm -hmm. because it has a role in the way it shapes us, in the way it make the, in the way we think, in the way we reason, um, in the way we relate with each other. So it definitely has a role. So when you think about the way we dress, the way Westerners dress is different from the way in, in Central Uganda people dress or in Eastern Uganda. So it does have a role in the way it organizes society. When you said uh, positive culture, mm -hmm. um, Lynette had a reaction. <laughs> yes, I wondered what positive culture is. To me, I think culture is culture and it should stay. All the, I think there's even now, there's a difference between, um, I should say, 40 plus and then the lower generation. There's a very big difference because the culture now is not the same because people are killing it slowly by slowly. And you find someone of 50 years not reasoning or thinking the same way like the one who has been raised now. And they will not do things the same way the others will do them. Uh, there are things that people will do now, okay, let's talk about the kneeling, let's talk about the dressing, let's talk about, um, um, there's so many things. Let's talk about female genital mutilation, <laughs> let's talk about <laughs> child marriages, oh, by let's talk about marital rape. By yes. positive culture, you mean these are not positive? No, those are not positive. Okay. So I, I wanted, uh, Eunice, if you could tell us what you meant by positive culture so that we can all be on the same page. Um, basically, po positive is opposite of negative. Negative cultural norms are those that actually harm us, i.e. child marriages. If you think about Uganda, one in every two girls are married before the age of 18. Is that a culture you want to promote? I can't imagine my daughter getting married at 14 years, but in Uganda it still happens. I can't imagine my daughter, if she was from a certain part of Uganda, being subjected to female genital mutilation, because it's culture as well. So I can't imagine that uh, marital rape should stay because it's part of, you know, once you're married, you've consented, and it's fine. So yes. Jimmy, you want to weigh in? Yeah, I think the starting point should be that um, 
culture is often a response to a people's surroundings, to a people's circumstances. And as such, it would mean that the things we've been doing at particular times have in most cases been a response to uh, whatever, was, whatever ensued in those times. And that would mean that we shouldn't look at culture as a static thing. We shouldn't look at culture as uh, something that is frozen in time, but it has always been like this, it should always be like that. Perhaps at a particular point in time, our knowledge was limited. There are certain things we didn't know. So our culture at that time responded to what we knew. So we cannot insist, even when we get more knowledge, that Let's we should stick still to live this. as stick bar mm -hmm. to the same standards. So I believe that um, culture should be progressive, culture should grow, culture should evolve. Should be if dynamic. there are certain things that we realize at a certain point that we have always treasured that, of course it doesn't mean that in acknowledging that you are admitting we've been foolish as such. It was important in those For circumstances where we felt or where, where we knew that that was uh, what was helpful. But once times evolve and you realize it's no longer as helpful, then you change because if you don't move, then I think there is a risk. Either that culture of the dying um, or people choosing to defy, to join other whatever they think is more progressive. So a culture that is uh, helpful should be one that grows. Well, Lynette seems to disagree with the two of you. Are you glad you sat next to me and not on the other side? I'm kidding. What, do you think culture evolves? Or do you think that it is foolish for us to try and change things that have worked for, or worked for years? Evolving is okay, but not removing it completely. Mm. I believe in evolving, mm. developing, because uh, I believe some cultures were done because they were ignorant of what they were doing. They didn't know, like the female mutilation, she talked about, maybe they didn't know if they cut certain organs from a woman, what would happen. They didn't even know that biology. All they thought is, once you're going to marriage, you're going there and you'll be there, you have nowhere to go. If the man is not pleased with you, he'll go and get another woman. Not knowing maybe why the woman acted in the way she acted. Well, Actually, do you support? Knew. Do you support female genital mutilation? I don't. Okay. Yes. So there are some cultures that you also feel are redundant yes. or they really have no place in today's. They are, they are inhuman. They outlived their importance. You said? Cultures that have outlived their importance. Actually, I think it would be more, it would be more helpful if we said norms that have outlived their importance, not cultures as such, mm. because culture is the wall. Mm. Within that mm. wall, there are particular norms, so we are not really talking about discarding everything. Mm. And uh, in response to your concern that culture should not die, mm. I don't think cultures can die as such in their entirety. Mm. Even when what you talk about as cultures dying, it means another culture is coming in. Oh, yes. Maybe you're only saying a particular culture should not die. Mm but there can never be a group of people without a culture at a particular time. Mm. So even if the traditional one, uh, let's say the ethnic one is wiped away at a certain point, mm. and which cannot happen actually uh, at a certain point, or a particular point in time. Mm. If it's progressively wiped out, it will be replaced by another. Yes. So the question should be, is it replaced by something better at that time that we think responds to our questions, our needs, our values. But there is also a question of, uh, we may call it etiquette. Sometimes there is a value behind something and there is a way that value is expressed. So we might not want the value to be lost, let's say, in kneeling that is being talked about. Mm. The value behind is respect. I think most of us would say that respect is a good thing. So we don't want respect to be lost, but maybe the expressions, some people have reservations about it. So that can be discussed, but it does mean the culture... Uh, Jimmy, when, when, when you saw... Did you see Winnie Bianima Street? Yeah. What did you think when you saw it? Um, about three things. One, the message. Two, the communicator, the one who is sending the message. And three, the mode of communication. The message in itself could have been a good thing, especially um, in a way of inviting us for a discussion. Mm -hmm. But sometimes a good message is lost 
because we focus on the one who is communicating. Considering that Winnie Vyanyima is not a Munganda or doesn't come from a culture that values kneeling or that uh, expresses respect by kneeling, I think chances were high that whoever was reading that could uh, interpret it in terms of cultural prejudice or simply by asking, okay, here is a Mnyangole telling us what to do. So the opportunity to discuss is lost by concentration by on who is sending the message, <coughs> which I think is natural. And by that, I also think the anima would have been more, should have been more careful in tweeting that, knowing how it would be received. Because criticism, and in this case, cultural criticism is not an end in itself. What's more Society important is what we want it. to achieve. So sometimes mm -hmm. you choose to keep quiet about something, not because you're not opposed to it, but because you know that your talking is counterproductive. It's not going to lead to what you want to achieve, which okay. is what I see in that case. Yes. And I disagree. Okay. Mm. I think she actually managed to capture the audience. It got us talking and speaking, even beyond the kneeling to speak about culture like we are now. So I think she really made, meant to catalyze discussion, which she achieved. And I think she doesn't really care about the poor response that she got from some sections of society because she wanted to catalyze and some of these difficult discussions, maybe there will never really be that perfect moment when you can pitch such a difficult discussion. And I think maybe what it has helped us to do is to have an introspection. For me personally, I was able to say, where is the state of Ugandans on this aspect in terms of norms, in terms of being an open society that is willing to actually even put aside the traditions that we've grown up in to be able to question, can we have a critical discussion? So for me, that raised questions about us as Ugandans, whether we we are supposed to accept everything that was given down to us or we can even begin to question. So I've been asking guys mm -hmm. our, our age, like, um, would you want your wife to kneel for you? And they say no. So would you want your daughter to kneel for you? And they say no. Then they say, but I want my daughter to kneel for my mother and my father. So they are conflicted. So it gave us space to actually have this discussion. Okay. Well, we're going to continue with this discussion. Alinette, I'm sure you're trying to say something. I heard you make some remarks. So let's take a short break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. We are coming to you live from the Kampala Serena Conference Center, Nile Room. And we're talking about culture. So I wanted to know from, from you, did you have something to say about what we're talking about before or should we proceed? Yes, about the tweet? Yes. Yes. Uh, we need to be summarized for everyone. She should not summarize for everyone. If it is not like that in her culture or in her tribe, let others follow what they know, what they think is right. Because you, humiliating ritual is a big statement. It re, you know, she sounded like uh, those that are kneeling, uh, uh, I don't want to use a big word. Those that are kneeling look stupid before the people they are kneeling before. No, they are not. And if she didn't feel good when the lady knelt before her, then she should have told her, you know what, me, I don't believe in kneeling, and please, I feel I'm really putting you down when you kneel. I'm not okay with you kneeling before me, and don't do it again. I'm sure the lady wouldn't have done it. And if she wanted to post it on social media, maybe it would come as a question, and then people give their views, but not putting it as a statement and telling the world they should stop and no one should kneel. Well, somebody will humiliating. argue that in this day and age of uh, all these platforms, you have the freedom to speak as you will and mm. say what you want or mm. communicate what you feel that is, is the message you want to put out there. Yes, but you, do, you should also care about where you're sending the message. Josephine, I will not come and tell you something because I want to tell it to you. I'll either find a way of, of uh, communicating, I'll find a better way of approach, but I'll not just come to you and, you know, just utter it out the way I want. No, I care about how you'll feel and I'll care about what will come out and the response. Your response might actually be worse than mine. Well, <laughs> in, in this day and age, who decides what we pick and take from culture and what we leave? 
is because there's no committee that sits and says uh, now we can all accommodate twins or now let's be happy with kneeling or no now let's stop kneeling who decides i would say that um international norms have been set if you think about human rights uh, a lot of our cultures or i should say negative culture is against international human rights and international human rights have set a standard which is universal which applies to all of us so it requires all the countries that signed on to international treaties to be able to then implement them at um, national level so i would say that's one way of setting the norms so before mm. you go so it's mm. very easy to look at that and say an outsider is coming to tell us what to do and how is that acceptable actually you know for the international universal declaration many of the developing countries signed it so it's not an outsider it was by consensus and also there are other laws and policies that the government of Uganda has passed that set uh, the norm and the standards, i.e. if the legal age for marriage is 18 years, that has been set now, and therefore anyone who is marrying off their girls before the age of 18, they should know they are going against the national laws and policies. Okay. Jimmy? Yeah, I think um, international standards will tell us about certain things, like... Um, uh, that it's good to respect human life, it's... Um, Child marriages, yes, FGM. Uh, such things, but it may not go to the specifics. So the specifics are often changed, or the need to change is found within the context of those that practice it. Sometimes it's spontaneous, no one really tells you that you have to change this, you just find that over time you switch to something else. Sometimes you realize that the times can no longer allow whether you want to continue practicing it or not, uh, it just can't continue. Uh, so that could also be one of the processes. Uh, so they, uh, it can start internally or externally, because one thing we have to realize is that being part of a particular community or part of a particular culture at times blinds you to certain things. There are things I've been uh, doing from my childhood, I was taught, and even those who taught me will tell me that, well, that's how we were raised. But I've never paused to ask questions about them. So sometimes it takes an outsider to tell you, hey, why do you do that? And then that's when you also pause to ask yourself, okay, so I've been doing this all this long, but do I even know the value behind it? So outsiders can invite you to a change or can invite you to reflection that reflection. then sends you to a change. So I think it's a, a process that comes from different uh, directions and depending on the times, the knowledge that you have at a particular point in time. Lynette, do you agree that before we start um, accepting or just taking on what our parents and grandparents passed on to us, that maybe we should sit and wonder why this was so, this was done this way, and why we are still doing it? Or should we just take it? I'm one person that was, was really so talkative when I was young. They would tell me to do something, and I would always ask my mother, why do why? we do this? And she would explain to me. And I would find it OK. Like, I've ever asked why, why you can't, uh, why there are some cultures in Buganda where they tell you you cannot cross your father-in-law's compound. I went back and asked my mother, Mommy, did you also do this? I am married and I'm, I'm being told I can't do this. So she told me the reason why they didn't want to do that is to respect your father-in-law's compound. And in case there's anything wrong with you, your father-in-law doesn't need to see you in that problem. Do you, do you still and totally... I, I still ask, by the way. Even when I'm raising my children, before I instill a certain culture in them, I'll ask my mother, why did you raise us like this? Because I remember when I'd just given birth, my mother told me, whatever I told you to do, and you think it has helped you be where you are, it has helped you be who you are, teach your children. Whatever you feel has not helped you in any way, please don't teach your children. And I still find all of them important. Well, do you think there's a place for understanding why a certain culture was, came about? why it's being done, and then realizing that maybe it doesn't fit society today, but how can we preserve the intention that was behind 
what it was for and find another option, for example. I don't know if you understand my question. Please. I do. I agree totally. When I think about the fact that um, our forefathers or foremothers really used traditional medicine in, um, in health, and that has been lost along the way because of not documentation or not passing on the tradition, mm -hmm. I totally agree that there's a place for us to go back and introspect and say, what is it that we needed to really maintain? So if you think about that 70% of Ugandans still use traditional medicine instead of going to hospitals because anyway, they can't afford it. I think there's a place for us to actually amplify positive culture. And so that has been lost. The positive culture that we had has been lost. What we focused on a lot are the things that are really not as helpful. Jimmy? Um, I think um, uh, it's more to do with whether, first of all, we understand uh, those cultures, we understand the values we are raised in, um, to start with. Uh, in most of our contexts, uh, or some, I shouldn't say most, you're raised doing certain things that you may not really understand. And sometimes there is no room for asking. There is either no room for asking or you may never feel the need to ask because you're simply trained to do something. And I think that is a bit problematic. Uh, partly I understand it's done because at a certain age, maybe our parents may not ex expect us to understand. So they may only give you taboos. Uh, don't do this, don't do this. If you do this, this will happen. And at times uh, the explanations they attach may not make sense. So later when you feel they don't make sense, you just abandon it. Yet there was a value behind it. So I think we should move towards uh, the direction of helping our people appreciate uh, their cultures, that if there is a value behind, we can understand that value and know why we should continue doing that. But that there should also be uh, what I may call cultural freedom. Cultural freedom in the sense, sense that uh, we should be free to discuss our culture. Mm. People should not be gagged that when you talk about this, ah, no, how, who are you to uh, start talking how about that? How dare you? <laughs> how dare you start questioning things that we have been doing uh, for years and years, for Some generations years. and generations, not knowing that it could have been relevant for those generations, but maybe not now. Or perhaps it's still relevant, but one is simply trying to appreciate. So cultural freedom meaning that we have some room for discussion to understand, to appreciate, and to know what is helpful, what is not helpful. But also cultural freedom in the sense that uh, there should be some room to choose not to do certain things mm -hmm. if I don't feel like doing them. Mm -hmm. We normally take cultural freedom to mean the freedom to practice a culture. But I think it should also involve the freedom not to practice. I know that's a bit difficult in our context because there are always sanctions. Uh, some people may tell you, but you're free to do this or not to do it. But you know that structurally you're not free. You may choose, for example, not to kneel. But what does that attract in society? If mm -hmm. I choose not to kneel while greeting, I, uh, I posted a question on, my, uh, on Facebook asking whether some, whether ladies, specifically of Uganda, would choose to kneel if there was an option of not kneeling. But the answer somehow showed that if you choose not to kneel, there is a price to pay. And the price is that we have those tags, namaguatala, naluali, nalukalala, and no one wants to be labeled that way. I'm going to assume that means something yeah. about being bad mannered. <laughs> yes, of course, somehow okay. about being bad mannered. And someone said that you choose to do that if you're also ready not to be married because no man will choose uh, someone who is not ready to do that, maybe a Mganda man. And this is not to say that kneeling is a bad thing as such, but it's to show that what we sometimes call freedom is not real freedom, that you don't have the actual space within which to choose that I'm going to do that and not to do that. It's just a <coughs> semblance of freedom. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't know if this would qualify as culture. Really, I'm just learning from all of you. But I know that a long time ago, the extended family was a big thing for a lot of African homes. But it's something that somehow has 
it's not there anymore. Now it's every man for himself. Have we had influences come from outside and take away from our culture, a certain maybe richness from our culture that we should have preserved? Yes. <laughs> yes. I think, yeah, we can't shy away from the effects of globalization. Globalization comes with its own positives and its own negatives. So we are now one global community. So you find that whereas previously you lived in the same vicinity, we have now had to have more rural urban migration. So you migrate to the urban center. So you're no longer with your rural community or your tribesmates. So you have now a new community actually, a new family you have, or you actually migrate to outside Uganda. So you can no longer have uh, what we had before living in the same homestead. So yeah, those are the effects of globalization, both positive and negative. We miss out on the extended family. That time, uh, in terms say of disciplining, it didn't have to be the biological parents to discipline a child. The whole village could discipline you if they found you walking late from the well. But now it's just only your mother and father, and that's if you're lucky to have both parents in the home. So yes. So there are some good things that we should not allow to lose from culture. Yes, certainly. Um, as an ed, families were really good, and uh, I think it's impossible, but you can still make it. I think when you're within, 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 um, within the country, you can still make it. But the thing of extended family would really help because now the things parents cannot tell their daughters or their sons because they feel it is not right for them to tell them because even them they were told by some other people so I think that culture should stay well there's um, some comments from social media mm. and somebody says I don't Joram Daka says I don't agree with these panelists do they really expect that we need uh, do they expect we need anima to address this issue from a Ugandan perspective and I think they're coming from the point of view that she, she's not living in Uganda now, so how is she now talking about something that is practiced by Ugandan? I think that's being diversionary. Winnie Bianyuma is a Ugandan. She has lived here for a long time. She has experienced this culture, and uh, even if she wasn't Ugandan, even if she didn't live here, I think every human being has a right to an opinion. It's really freedom of speech, freedom of expression. And so I think what he should focus on really is, does he agree with her view, with her perspective, with her insight or not? But the fact that she's now an international actor who is still actually championing women's rights does not mean that she does not have entitlement to an opinion. Jimmy? I don't know whether the person is asking um, if Winnie Vianima thought that she could address, she, she could solve it, or she could um, abolish kneeling, which I don't think was uh, Winnie's intention. I think partly the intention could have been to, to, um, to initiate debate, to initiate a discussion. Although somewhere, I think, I don't, I don't remember whether this was part of the tweet uh, that she said it should be abolished. You, you mentioned particular words that were in her tweet, and I think that the was where was most of the concentration was. Humiliating ritual. Okay, but she didn't say that it should be abolished. No, by, but by saying it's a humiliating ritual, okay. it indirectly yeah. means it's yeah. a bad thing and it shouldn't be done. Yeah, I think in that sense I would look at it as um, expressing her opinion about it, and it takes us back to the question of who should criticize which culture, who should critique uh, a culture, should it be only the insiders, should it be outsiders? Uh, even if we are to say that Winnie Vianima was not Ugandan, if she was from another country, another continent, does she have the right to comment about what the Baganda in Uganda do? So that debate is always there within cultural discussion. Um, at times insiders saying that no, outsiders should not tell us what to do. But as I said earlier, sometimes it only takes an outsider uh, to see certain things, although outsiders could also be so wrong over something because they've not taken something to understand it. And um, the problem I find in that tweet is that 
which is partly because I said that uh, we should also look at the form of communication that was used. Uh, because Twitter may not allow a lot of explanation, Winnie Vyanyima does not talk about the value behind kneeling. She goes straight to the etiquette. She goes straight to the practice of kneeling, uh, which is partly why maybe those from the culture where that's practiced may not appreciate the message. They feel that you want to throw away everything. You want to throw away the expression plus the value behind it. So she's entitled to her opinion, but we should look at the question to what end? What do we want to achieve? Can it be achieved by doing that? If I express myself on Twitter by saying this, do I make the situation better or do I make it worse? Sometimes we know that by criticizing a particular community as an outsider, and as an outsider in a context like Uganda where we know there is some ethnic strife that is some sort of an undercurrent which we may not admit to, that may not allow certain people to take messages from certain other groups yes. of people. So I think she should have been sensitive to that or to know, especially in terms of what she would achieve by her, Winnie Vyanyima, with all her identities, because no one of us comes with one identity. At times you assume you're talking as a feminist, but the one who is listening to you or looking at you is not seeing a feminist. They are seeing... You uh, in your other Soga. capacity. They are seeing uh, an elite. They are seeing uh, a woman. Yeah. I think she should have been yeah. sensitive to all those identities she carries and how they would inform the interpretation. Well, I'm glad for one thing that at least she allowed us to have this debate because I think it was something that we pushed yeah. under the rug uh, yeah. talking about culture. But we'll continue that debate shortly. Let's take a short break and we'll be right back and start with you, Lynette. Welcome back. We're coming to you live from the Kampala Serena Conference Center, Nile Room, and tonight we are talking about culture. Um, I'll take one comment from social media. Ian Muhumza says, I can tell you the more people get educated, the more their brains open, calling for more questions, and hence some culture norms that they will realize were useless will always be dropped. In other words, culture is gone, is going to, I think it's going to change with time. I, I think that's what you, you, you're saying. Um, Lynette, you wanted to say something? Yes. Um, with all due respect to our cultural leaders, can there be an organization or an arrangement to have our cultural leaders come and discuss reasons why they chose certain cultures? But do you think that they are the ones that chose them or it was the people before, no, before, of before? Some, of course, and those were also cultural leaders. They are cultural leaders, and in most cases they actually inherited. And, and also I think... One I th dies, then one takes over, and another takes over. But I'm very sure they know why... Uh, let me give an example. Uh, an example of the, of the Katikiro of Buganda. Of course he knows why certain cultures are there. Recently I had him complaining about Kwanjula. And he's saying I think it has been blown out of, of, of proportion. And they, sh they should revise it or take it back to how it was before. So I believe, I'm very sure, they know. Jimmy, I'm going to ask you this question because you, you are a senior lecturer, so I'm thinking you, you have an idea about, about this. These cultures, I, I think in my little understanding, it would be that it was passed on from generations, right? So mm -hmm. if I said, for example, that why were people having so many children uh, back then and now a lot of people want to have, some people want to have very many children because it was a thing that was done. And then maybe because it was at that time that uh, you had to have about 12 or 13 children because maybe there was no vaccination, so the children were dying, mm. or there was no family planning, or mm. for whatever reason. But we've mm. picked it up. Who paper. was making mm. these decisions? Some of them are spontaneous, I would think. that it does not even take the whole community to sit down and say, now we are going to start... Uh, living our lives according to these norms that you just find yourselves organizing your society in a certain direction. Others could be deliberate that you realize you're faced, by, you're, you're faced with a certain threat that you have to respond to and that threat calls for certain norms, it calls for certain action. Yes, certain actions or you have to limit uh, the conduct of this group of people, you have to put uh, certain uh, sorts of um, uh, bolts on uh, on conduct in society uh, but we may not say that there is always a one way uh, there has always been a certain one way in which 
a, a people seat or a people agree that this is what we should hold or not. Uh, but as I said, um, in societies that are centralized, where there are institutions, let's say, uh, in Buganda or in uh, Bunyoro, those institutions could play a role, uh, as in the example she has given, that the Katikiro could come up, come out at a certain point and say, I think Wanjula is, ro is losing meaning. Uh, we should remove this or that, or we should add or this or that. Or go back to what it was. But some communities are not really centralized. That may not be there, but they also have a way of regulating their, their, their conduct. So I think it's more about adapting to situations that certain things automatically drop, others are deliberately dropped. So you think it could it be a personal thing that I I honestly don't agree with this and I'm not doing it anymore? Yes. In some societies I think it starts with individual rebellion. Individuals um, saying that I don't agree with this, uh, of course it could attract certain sanctions or uh, forms of um, sometimes they become outcasts but in the process they are appreciated. It starts, could start with a lone voice it could be your voice. Um, <laughs> it could be his voice. Don't make her a bone my It may not be realized in that generation. It could even take so many other generations for it to be appreciated. Well, I'm going to allow for two questions from our studio audience, and we'll very quickly um, take yours. What criteria do you use to evaluate the value of culture? What criteria do you use to evaluate the value of culture? One, I think it's about the people are the custodians of that culture or the people that live that culture. When they find it meaningful or they find it uh, helpful to them, sometimes it's not even helpful, they just like it. Mm. That could um, be the first criterion to consider if uh, they should continue living it or not. Sometimes it's um, out of consideration that you don't live as an island. In this age, for example, where there is so much intercultural connection, unlike in the past where you could be some sort of isolated community, there are certain things you consider that, well, we've always been doing this, but now that we are in contact with these other people, should we, for example, continue assuming that, uh, well, this may not be politically correct, that all well, let me leave that. <laughs> I think you should. <laughs> yes, but it's out of looking at the context, whether something is still relevant or not. Yeah, and many other considerations, both deliberate or not uh, deliberate. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, another comment from social media. Jude Odele says, culture, like someone in the show just hinted, is progressive. Most of this aspect is evident today in fashion. It has had a very big impact on various cultures today. Uh, that's Jude's comment. Let's take another question very quickly. Yeah, I'm called Muhammad Benson. My question goes direct to the lady next to the gent. Uh, he talked about, she talked about uh, positive culture and negative culture. How do you know that this is a positive culture and this is a negative culture? Yes, it is embraced by that culture, the, those people within that culture. Well, Eunice, okay. as you respond to that, I'll just give you one minute to respond and then s tell us what you'd like us to go away from this conversation with you and then we'll quickly go around. Okay, um, thank you for that question. I'll speak about negative cultural norms or harmful traditional practices. Internationally, there are some practices that we've come up with that um, recognize as harmful, i.e. widow inheritance. So this woman dies from, H uh, this gentleman dies from HIV and then you want her to be inherited by the brother of the man. Definitely in this day and age that is going to spread the disease. So that has been recognized as harmful. Or um, widow cleansing. If your husband dies, then they get, they get this witch doctor to sleep with you so that you can be cleansed. Clearly, that's so clear that it's harmful. Female genital mutilation, cutting of the clitoris. What does that mean? It means that you're trying to kill the sexuality of this young girl. It's harmful. It's quite clear. It doesn't need any explanation. But yeah, to wrap up and say, what do we take from this? Culture is not static. Culture should be dynamic. It should be progressive. It should be to promote development and not keep us backwards. Yeah. So let us not fear to openly question and say, is this harmful? Is this positive? And then take what we believe works best. Jimmy, would you like in 30 seconds to summarize for us? 
It's a good thing that uh, first of all we are able to discuss our cultures, we are able to make sense of things that we may not have earlier even thought we could discuss or even ever imagined that we could pause, pause and reflect about. Um, which takes me back to what I said earlier, that those who gag anyone who comes up to talk about a certain cultural aspect, it even invites suspicion. What is it that you're defending so much that it should not even be talked about? I think we should invite debate such that we can even be proud of our cultures, that I can stand up to defend it. It's something that we do in our culture. I understand, I know, and it's for this... Uh, value reason, yeah. yeah instead of uh, making it um, appear to be sacrilegious for people to talk about certain things and sometimes making it uh, making certain things appear so mystical as not to be appreciated not to be engaged with i think that in the end might uh, kill culture yeah. instead of promoting it okay yeah. finally Lynette. um we are here and we are running away from some cultures because we don't know why they were set up. We don't know why they were put for us to follow. So I'm still calling for that debate between cultural leaders and they call the youths, put them together and tell them why a particular culture. Of course, the youth will give them the cultures that they want them to talk about. Let them just not just stay. I think they are there to, to give information about culture. So let the people know, let them put up debates, let them put up, uh, let them put up discussions. And I think, Josephine, you should actually put this as the next debate with cultural leaders and you try to explain why certain cultures are followed. And then we decide whether we should actually follow them or not, or decide which ones to follow and which ones not to follow. I'm also Thank wondering you. if this is not a debate that should be had in homes, mm. first of all, so that <laughs> that information on, on what is important with the culture is passed on. Some family, parents also I think don't it's, know. It's something that's been ignored, mm. maybe. Yes, some and parents also don't know. If they also get to know, then they can pass it on to the children or they raise the children knowing what they're actually instilling in them. All right. Well, thank yes. you very much, all of you, for sharing these insights with us. And that was our show for this week. Coming up is NTV Weekend Edition. Keep it NTV.